Hello people, welcome. So, um, before I get on to topic today, okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, okay, but just answer the nonsense. Um, I'll give an update, okay. Um, quiz is over, congratulations to Trey X. Um, he has got his prize, I have sent him it today. Um, I'm waiting for Nick Hammer to send me his list and I will send him those. So the quiz is now finished, which now frees up more of my time. Um... My new 17 playlists are ready and empty on my playlist section, okay, for the new career videos. Um, I'm gathering um, some emails together. So the only two things I've got to do now prior to the 22nd or 23rd of um, July um, is basically finish my Hall of Fame and the Hall of All Time Greats. Well, I've also um, put some work into that. I'm, I need to spend um, another good day getting that ready and finished off then that is ready um, and then I'm pretty much all set to go okay um, stat books will continue um, I'm not gonna do one today because um, I've had a bit of a interrupted day uh, but a few will come tomorrow so okay on to the topic at hand now this isn't so much a response to the person who came out with this statement because I find him irrelevant um, I don't respect his opinion on boxing at all um, you know in, in reference and you always know what kind of level you're speaking to um, you know when people say certain things like take the Leonard Durant trilogy you know um, um, this person who apparently rates Durant top 10 all time which kind of gives you an indication of why he believes this and why he says this um, it's to help justify his belief that Duran is a top 10 all time fighter, uh, something I question completely um, he probably rates Duran number one lightweight of all time, maybe he does maybe he doesn't, I don't know, but he probably rates him very highly there um, probably doesn't know too much about the other lightweights, he'll know something but certainly not to a level where they can parade Duran as this all time conqueror um, but Duran um, in the first Ray Leonard fight and when you know Duran's career, Duran had probably the hardest fight of his career, okay? He had the hardest fight of his career. It was a grueling 15-round war against an unbeaten lineal welterweight champion, Sugar Ray Leonard, an Olympic gold medalist, okay, um, who was one of the best welterweights at the last 50 years. Um, and it was a very, very hard fight. Now, coming out with a term saying... Well, Duran won the first fight, and the next two fights, Duran won in shape, so they don't matter. No one cares about them. Well, you know, you see, I always answer that a bit differently to that, and that shows that certain bias, okay? Um, like the bias of saying that, um, you know, he could pick Jeffries to beat Jack Johnson in their primes, but when it came to McVeigh and Mike Tyson, he suddenly seemed to need footage well, we don't exactly have pals of footage of Jim Jeffries, do we? But he didn't seem to need that to make a decision. So you start to see patterns in people. Um, now, about the Leonard Duran thing, I categorically reject that entire notion that the next two fights don't matter. And the reason I reject that notion is because Duran had the hardest fight of his career, in my mind, up to that point, okay, against Sugar Ray Leonard in the first fight. Duran won on a close decision. He dragged Leonard into his fight, and he came out on top, narrowly came out on top. Now, Duran, okay, and this is why I reject nonsense when people say, oh, no, the next two fights don't matter. Duran wasn't in shape. I will just... I don't, I, no, I've got to be careful, okay? I don't want to upset anyone, okay, because I have a different opinion. Um, but Duran has just fought the hardest fight of his career. He's just won a world title in his second weight class. Welterweight. He's become WBC linear welterweight champion. Against a fantastic opponent. And now Duran knows he's fighting him again. Okay? So what does Duran do? He's partying. He's living the high life. Um, he's doing all this stuff. He knows. He knows. He's fighting Sugar Ray Leonard. So basically, my my counterclaim to any of this, well, Duran won the first fight because I rate him top 10, uh, and the next two Leonard fights don't matter. If Duran was not in shape for the second fight, then all I'll say is that's his problem. It's not Sugar Ray Leonard's problem, and his wins can't be dismissed. Making Duran nomas cannot be dismissed because Duran was unprofessional 
okay, and let himself balloon out of shape after having the hardest fight of his career. That's his problem. It's his job to get into shape. You can't discredit Sugar Ray Leonard's wins because Jerome was unprofessional, piled weight on, and couldn't get in proper shape for the second fight. And I actually sometimes question the fact Jerome wanted in shape for the second fight. He made weight. He didn't look too bad to me. The difference is um, people like this guy will diminish the second Leonard Duran fight because Duran lost. And that to me is the only reason why you would degrade it and say no, Leonard's wins don't matter. Okay, um, because Leonard put on a masterclass. Sugar Ray Leonard embarrassed him, mocked him, humiliated him. And then Sugar Ray Leonard, using the tools that he had, footwork, speed, of foot and speed of hand, his cleverness, his ring intelligence, he made Duran look a fool in that ring. He was mocking him. He was embarrassing him. Duran could do nothing. Okay, and that is why Duran lost. Not because he was miraculously so terribly out of shape. A more in shape Duran wouldn't have won that night because Leonard's tactics meant that Duran was going to be pretty much ineffective. And Duran quit. No mass, no more, no more. I mean, if you ask Scrapbook, Bruce Gass, Blood Boxing, beat some rhymes. Duran quitting against Sugar Ray Leonard was a major, major scandal in boxing. There were some people saying he needs banning from the sport because he quit when he when he, he hadn't be he hadn't been beat up he wasn't taking a pound in round after round he just quit because he couldn't get the fight his own way that is not Sugar Ray Leonard's fault that is not the crowd's fault that is Roberto Duran's fault and that was a scandal if he wasn't in shape it's Roberto Duran's fault that he ballooned up in weight. It's Roberto Duran's fault, although they say, you know, he ballooned up in weight, but then he made weight for the fight, so work it out. But basically, all these things people say, you can't... So, by you, by someone saying... I won't, I won't refer to this, this fool um, in this. But when someone says, well, the guy I rate top 10 won the first fight, the next two fights don't matter. Now, he says he was not diminishing or degrading any fighters. But by saying Sugar Ray Leonard's brilliant performance... In the second fight, where he came in, he knew Duran now. He realised that Duran had dragged him into a war the first fight and came out on top. Leonard came into the second fight with that fantastic ring intelligence he had. With a completely different game plan. And Duran couldn't deal with it. Fact. That is all there is to it. Duran couldn't deal with Leonard's skills when Leonard was being evasive. He was moving, firing quick shots, then getting out of it. Duran just couldn't deal with it. That is the be-all, end-all. But when you say Leonard coming back after his first career defeat to become a two-time lineal WBC champion, completely making the only opponent who'd bet him quit in a ring, when you say that is unimportant and people don't care about it, you are diminishing Sugar Ray Leonard. You are degrading Sugar Ray Leonard's accomplishment. Whether you accept you're degrading his accomplishment or not, most people would say you are degrading Sugar Ray Leonard's accomplishment. Now, I know I've got to be careful, okay? I don't want to upset him, okay? Because I called him a small-minded YouTuber, um, and I did that on purpose because he was degrading fighters and diminishing fighters' accomplishments. So I called him a small-minded YouTuber, um, and he totally reacted, and suddenly it was a toxic conversation. Now, just to answer the toxic conversation, I did not swear at him. I was not... Well, if he'd have seen my last comment, he'd have probably had a hernia because uh, I really went foul in the last comment. But... Out of respect to channel owner, I deleted my comments. Okay, something the channel owner doesn't rescind uh, in respect. But I, I, will, I left that really egregious comment and I thought, nah, I can't leave that on this guy's channel. So I deleted my comments. Okay, as someone respectful would do. Um, but him saying, well, this toxic conversation. Now, what you've got to understand about some people like this on the internet is toxic conversation is get out of jail free card to those people who've played monopoly toxic conversation is get out of jail free card 
okay? What it means is I will no longer engage with you because you are doing nothing but firing question after question after question after question at me. And I'm not used to it, okay? I'm used to living in my echo chamber um, and I'm not used to anybody coming at me so strongly, which is why I'm not going to go strongly today, okay? I don't want to upset him. I might disrupt his whole weekend, okay? Um, but, you know, the fact is that if you degrade or diminish the accomplishments of a fighter like a fighter will get to Leo Florian Hook. That's his name, Leo Florian Hook. Um, basically, when you some people may not appreciate that. Some people who've studied him may not appreciate that and may come at you and want answers from you on why you think that. Okay, And if you're not willing to engage, then just don't say these things don't engage in panels don't call people and say oh get this person on you know because he wants to apparently debate me on something you know if you if you're so weak-willed and sensitive okay because i were really firing a lot of questions at, at this kid okay a lot of questions um and i think he quickly realized that i was not going to leave him alone that I was going to bombard him non-stop and therefore he thought yeah yeah Get out of jail free card. Monopoly. Get out of jail free card. Oh, this toxic conversation. I'd only called him a small-minded YouTuber. God, mate, if you'd have seen my last comment, you'd have really uh, blown a gasket. Because I proper went foul on him. Um, but, you know, when you say these things, people will respond. So, Leo Florian Hook. Now, one thing I want to mention about Leo Florian Hook, first of all, okay, in... Um, and my general talk is not on Leo Florian Hook. My general talk is for my subscribers, Okay. My general talk is for me, subscribers. Uh, I'm not interested in speaking to this person um, again. But I will say this before I get off him, okay? I've been in a YouTube debate retirement. The, the conversation with El Jefe was not... The conversation with El Jefe was not a debate. Because to debate any boxing topics, you have to actually have to know about the topics. Um, and I think that kid half at time... Couldn't tell time or know what planet you were on, to be honest. Um, so that wasn't a debate. Okay, I was just talking to him. But as for a proper debate, I haven't debated since I whitewashed a guy who then were a sore loser, and I think this kid would be as well. Um, like he saw when people leave comments at him. But basically, okay, I have been in debate retirement for years. I recently was nearly came out of it, okay, to engage in a Jack Johnson Marciano debate. Because I was just getting so annoyed by a guy who were on there waiting about rules, format, what, did, what does this mean? What's different diction definition? <laughs> but I will say right now, okay, that if anyone thinks Leo Florian Hook is not Hall of Fame worthy, and that includes this guy, and I know I've got to be careful, I don't want to upset him, I don't want to disrupt his weekend, okay, I will come out of my de debate, re debate retirement to debate is Leo Hook Hall of Fame worthy? You say he's not because, well, he ain't really done all, has he? As you said. Okay? I say he has. So there's a debate point. So I would happily challenge this kid to a live debate. Is Leo Hook Hall of Fame worthy? Now I know exactly what I will hear back. Okay? Are you ready? I'm going to demonstrate. Listen very carefully. When I challenge him to a debate on it, this is what I will hear. Starting now. Yeah, that's what I'll hear. Crickets. So, because I, honestly, if I call him a small-minded YouTuber and he gets offended, wait while I get him on a debate because I'm going hard style. Uh, on him, I'm going really hard. And not no nice it is like Shady Slim. Or others, no, no, no. I'll go really hard. I don't think he can handle it. I, I think he'd leave live stream. So now I want to address two points. First two points on Leo Florian Hook, okay? Two points that were made is that he fought a um, inexperienced uh, Green Levinsky and Green Dylan. Uh, green Levinsky and Green Jack Britton. Um, I reject both of those, okay? Um, Leo Hook's first fight with Battling Levinsky, who turned professional at a much higher weight than Leo Hook. Um, his first fight with Levinsky, Levinsky already had over 120 rounds fight experience. By the time of one of their fights, 
Levinsky had over 200 rounds fight experienced and had fought fighters like Glover, Dylan, etc. So basically saying that a fighter with over 200 rounds professional experience, you know, is ridiculous and rejected. Um, Leo Hook fought um, a Green Jack Britain. Well, actually, the first fight with Britain were quite early on in Leo Hook's career and Britain's career. Um, but the last four fights they fought were all between Britain's fights from 40 to 60 fights. So Jack Britain, by time at last Leo Hook fight, had already had nearly 60 professional fights. So Leo Hook fighting a Green Jack Britain, again, rejected. Okay, so those two points are rejected outright. Um, he actually, when you fight a Levinsky who's fought over 200 rounds professional experience, um, fought a future welterweight champion, fought a future light heavyweight champion and one of his great rivals, uh, and last fight you have fought over 200 rounds experience when you fight Hook, you're not fighting someone green. And you're not fighting someone green, okay, when you fight him a number of times between a 40 and 60 fight mark on an all-time great fighter, even though Britain has not yet mixed in the welterweight company against Kid Lewis and, and Benny Leonard and Walker and all these guys, he's not inexperienced. And he wasn't a weak fighter, okay? Anyway, even 30 fights in, he was no pushover, no joke. So those two points are rejected. Now, another point on Leo Florian Hook that I want to get out there is, I will say, and I will state categorically, okay, that if Leo Hook is not worthy of being in the Hall of Fame, then you have to remove Billy Misk, you have to remove Mike Gibbons, you have to remove Tommy Gibbons. You've got to remove a whole number of fighters. If Leo Hook has not done enough to be accredited as a Hall of Famer, then there are a lot of Hall of Famers who need removing from the Hall of Fame, including Gibbons, etc., etc., okay? That's just how it is. That is just how it is, because there are parallels there, okay, and I'm going to discuss some of them. Now, some people, uh, this guy, because he loves, apparently, Tommy Gibbons, he's, oh, wow, Tommy Gibbons, oh, my goodness, Tommy Gibbons. Well, he's all of fame worthy, Leo Hook, nah, he didn't really do all. So, Tommy Gibbons, now, I, I already know, okay, I've dealt with people like him before, I already know where he's going, okay, well, Tommy Gibbons beat Andy Kev. Andy Kev's the greatest fighter of all time. Andy Kev has the greatest resume. And Andy Kev's my number one fighter of all time. And Tommy Gibbons beat him. So that means more than anything Leo Kevin did in his whole career. Yeah, we know that's where it's going to go. Okay. But, okay, what we're going to do is... In terms of Leo Florian Hook, we have to remember he turned pro around the flyweight region. Okay. He travelled up weights. Okay. Even quite early on in his career, because if Jack Britton were inexperienced after nearly 60 fights, then Leo Hook was inexperienced when he fought Levinsky and when he fought Britton as well. Yeah? Oh, no, no, we're not supposed to mention that, are we? You see, inexperience goes both ways. <laughs> but anyway, name on that. So Leo Hook turned pro, 1904, around the flyweight region. Now... Someone out there tell me, okay, what is one massive credit? What is one of the main things people give credit for, uh, to Manny Pacquiao for? Could it be that one of the major things Pacquiao gets credit for is travelling from flyweight where he won his first title? I didn't say that's where he turned pro. Okay, before nitpickers come in, well, Pacquiao. He first titled at flyweight and titled up to, like, middleweight. And over the years, I have heard so many people saying, oh my goodness, that weight move, it's incredible. It's never been done in boxing history as he has been done and outmatched many times. Kid Lewis, um, Britain, Carpentier, Hook, Langford. You know, so many fighters have moved far more weight than Manny Pacquiao. You know, it's another one of those urban myths. Um, but Pacquiao gets massive credit for the weight move, okay? On my first point on Leo Florian Hook... I say, okay, that any fighter, okay, who can travel from flyweight region all the way up to a heavyweight, okay, has to be considered, has to be given the credit for that. He has to be given credit for that weight move because if we are going to credit Pacquiao and we are going to credit Roy Jones going from light middle to heavy, the title scene was different. We're talking about the weight move, okay? 
then we have to credit Leo Hook the same. He moved far more weights than Mike Gibbons. He moved far more weight than Billy Misk. He moved far more weight than Tommy Gibbons. He moved far more weights than a lot of most Hall of Famers, aside from Kid Lewis, Carpentier, Britain, a few others. Okay, Leo Hook is in the top bunch of weight movers. You know, he fought Gumbo Smith in 1918, I think it was. Gumbo Smith is a heavyweight. Gumbo Smith is a heavyweight. Leo Hook fought from turning pro in 1904. By 1918, he had actually fought heavyweight. And he, he fought some other heavyweights as well. But he didn't really campaign there like Langford did because he'd come from even way lower weight than what Langford did. Okay? This is just a fact. So the first contention for Leo Hook being mentioned into the hall is the fact he is one of boxing's greatest weight movers of all time. Across all all fighters he's moved more weight than langford he hasn't done as much at heavyweight but he has moved more weight than langford more weight than mickey walker more weight than armstrong more weight than britain more weight than many many top level all-time greats so leo hook has to get credit for the weight move now moving weight is one thing okay but when you are, when you are talking about a short fighter you are talking about a fighter Weighed about five, he was about five seven five eight. Okay, and Leo Hook coming up from those lower weights, he was actually quite tall for a lower weight fighter. But coming up from those lower weights, okay, Leo Hook not only fought in those weights, but was highly competitive in those weights. And Leo Hook was not a Benny Leonard um, master boxer or a Tommy Lochran a master boxer. Leo Hook was a more game fighter. Okay, a rugged, strong game fighter. Even fighting men at bigger weights, he would often fight them coming on the inside. Uh, probably a good way of, of representing Leo Hook's style is when Mickey Walker fought uh, Max Schmeling. Mickey Walker didn't back up and try and box and move. Mickey Walker was moving into Max Schmeling. Mickey Walker was fighting Max Schmeling. Often in the pocket, Leo Florian Hook used to fight pretty much exactly the same way. He would attack your body relentlessly. He would move up to the head. He would try and push bigger men back. He would fight bigger men in the pocket. And when you consider, okay, not only the weight move from flyweight to fighting heavyweights, which is remarkable. And you know, before people discredit Leo Hook for fighting at heavyweight, well, most people don't discredit Roy Jones. Roy Jones had one fight there against John Ruiz. Yes, he won a title because the title picture is different to those people who are more naive on boxing, like this guy, obviously. Doesn't seem to know much about Leo Hook, hasn't done much research, probably just skimmed down his resume without really understanding the content of it. But, sorry, I don't want to upset him. I don't want to spoil his weekend. Poor lad, he might... He might. He might go and get his mummy to wipe his nose. Right, so, the weight move is first point, okay? Points rejected on fighting Green Levinsky, who in one of the fights had fought over 200 professional rounds, and fighting inexperienced Jack Britton, when four of the five fights happened between the 40 and 60 fight mark of Jack Britton's career, and Jack Britton had fought many professional rounds and was building a lot of experience. So, fighting Green Levinsky and Britton rejected, Leo Hook, the weight move, he has to get credit for that. Now, one of the, one of the, I've got to say this as well. One of the first um, main things, okay, I want to talk about, okay, because when you're talking about fighters moving up, you know, when you're talking about fighters moving up in weight, often they're judged on how they perform at those weights, yeah. Now, if I said a name out there, Harry Lewis, okay, does do a lot of people know now? Scrapbook. My brother in boxing would know Harry Lewis straight, uh, straight away. Harry Lewis was a formidable puncher. Harry Lewis was a real, real ring general. Okay, Harry Lewis was such an experienced fighter. And it's not just in the rounds he'd fought or the people he'd fought. Harry Lewis was a fantastic ring general in the ring. You know, what Harry Lewis didn't know about the boxing game wasn't worth remembering in the first place. We are talking about a major, major experienced fighter, okay, in um, Harry Lewis. 
And Harry Lewis, aside from Britain and Levinsky, Harry Lewis was one of the major um, opponents of Leo Hook. He'd fought many other fighters as well. He fought the very experienced Kid Beebe, okay, um, a number of times. He'd also fought people like Paddy Levin. You know, he'd also fought super experienced fighters, you know, like young um, Ernie and others, okay, um, young Lothry, okay. He'd fought experienced fighters, but really it was in 1910, okay, when Leo Hook twice beat the very experienced and fantastic fighter, Harry Lewis, okay, who was a dangerous fighter. Many people consider Harry Lewis a Hall of Fame welterweight, and then is Leo Hook, okay, only six years into his pro career after turning pro, he gains two wins over the superb fighter Harry Lewis, who was a fantastic body puncher, okay? A vicious body puncher, especially his left hooked up body. Uh, Harry Lewis's left hooked up body was one of his signature punches, and he took many men out with that shot. He hurt many men with that shot. But Harry Lewis knew how to box, he knew how to fight, he knew how to survive, he knew how to position himself in a ring, he knew how to attack opponents. He was a super experienced fighter leo hook beat him twice okay in 1910 he also in 1910 beat another name okay now a lot of people saying leo hook doesn't deserve to be in the hall okay let us just do a recap of 1910 okay what i'm going to do is a recap of just one year one year he drew with young ernie he lost to paddy Levin. Okay, he beat young Lothry, who was a very experienced fighter, then drew with him. Then he beat young Ernie. Okay, then he beat, uh, he lost to young Lothry again. Then he beat young Lothry. Then he beat Harry Lewis twice. Okay, then he beat another fantastic fighter, a should be Hall of Famer more than likely, in the excellent Jimmy Gardner. So this former flyweight, super flyweight fighter, after only six years as a pro, is moving up weights. And he's already fought Jack Britton five times, gaining a win. Okay, we'll come on to Levinsky shortly. But then in 1910, in one year, he's fought a number of very experienced fighters. He's got two wins against Harry Lewis. That same year, he also beats Jimmy Gardner. That same year, he also beats very experienced Fr uh, Frank Klaus. That same year... He then beats very experienced, very good fighter, Frank Mantell. And Leo Hook had a lot of fights in 1910. I'm just skimming over the surface, but already he's beat a welterweight Hall of Famer to most people, Harry Lewis, and a super experienced fighter, a vicious puncher. He's also beaten the excellent Jimmy Gardner. He's also beaten future lineal middleweight champion, Frank Klaus. One of the best middleweight champions of the 1910s. And he's also beaten the very experienced, capable Frank Mantell. That is what this former flyweight has done in one year. Then we go into 1911. Where he beats Battling Levinsky. He then loses a rematch to Frank Klaus. And don't say... Okay, that Frank Klaus was inexperienced. He'd, he'd had nearly 80 fights by this time. Okay. He then beats Battling Levinsky again. Then he scores a third win over Harry Lewis. Then he beats Joe Thomas. Do we know who Joe Thomas is? Check out Ketchell. Check out Ketchell's resume. Do we know who Joe Thomas is? Ketchell had some life or death brawls with Joe Thomas. This is what people who don't know the career of Leo, Leo Florian Hook don't know. When you are looking at the level of his opposition, he's already beaten one of the best lineal middleweight champions at 1910s. He's already three times beaten the superb Harry Lewis. He's already beaten Jimmy Gardner. He's already had a fight series with Jack Britton. He's already beaten Battling Levinsky. Klaus and Levinsky would go on to become lineal champions. Uh, middleweight and light heavyweight respectively he's beating many of these now all-time greats are hall of famers before they become champions not beating them after their prime not beating them down the line leo hook is beating them when they are not past their prime now in 1911 Okay, as well as beating Frank Mantell again, fighting a whole number of other people, he fights another name, George Chip. 
Now, to people who know of Harry Greb, you will recognise the name George Chip. He had a brother, Joe Chip, uh, who was not as good as George, but still quite dangerous. Just ask Harry Greb about that. Um, but he beat George Chip, okay? Uh, he's also beat a fighter who gave Ketchell some life or death struggles in Joe Thomas. Thomas had a style that didn't merge with Ketchell's very well. Thomas were very game. You know, they were some of those were hard fights for Ketchell. Okay, let me tell you. He's already beaten Joe Thomas, beaten Ida Lewis three times, beaten Levinsky, beaten Britain, on and on. Into 1911, he beats George Chip. Now, George Chip, like Frank Klaus, is another lineal middleweight champion of the 1910s. He beats Frank Mantel again, and then loses the rematch to Klaus. Then he gains win towards end of 1911 against battling Levinsky. And then he fights two fights against Buck Kraus. Book Krause, okay, is another very tough, experienced fighter. A very, very good fighter with many, many good wins to his credit. Leo Hook lost and drew to Book Krause. He then lost by stoppage to the Hoosier Bearcat, Jack Dillon, who in a few years' time would become lineal light heavyweight champion, and Dillon and Levinsky are more than likely the best light heavyweight champions of the 1910s. Have I forgot anyone? But, you get my point, Leo Hook is having super tough fight runs against many should be or are Hall of Famers and many fighters people would consider all time greats and he's picking up many wins and he's moved up a lot of weight. He has moved up from lower weights than Levinsky, he has moved up from lower weights than Jack Dillon, he has moved up from lower weights than Buck Krause, he has moved up from lower weights than Harry Lewis. The superb Harry Lewis, who on my new career videos will get a video done. You'll finally get the career video on Harry Lewis when I get to Welterweight. So Leo Hook is mixing in super tough company. And now his career has kicked into high, high gear. He just carries on. He beats in 1912 former light heavyweight champ Bob Moha. Loses to Buck Krause again. 1912, he beats George Chip. 1912, he then beats another former lineal middleweight champion who also gave Ketchell wars in Billy Papke. Leo Hook is gaining wins over many fighters who gave Ketchell real hard fights. Really hard wars. Leo Hook is gaining scalps over fighters who pushed Stanley Ketchell all the way. So, does he not get any credit for that? Not to some people. Because even from what I've said there, he's had a five-fight series with Jack Britton, he's had a multi-fight series with Battle and Levinsky, he's had a multi-fight series with Jack Dillon already, he's had three straight wins over the dangerous Harry Lewis, he's already fought a multi-fight series against Frank Klaus, multi-fights against Buck Krause, multi-fights against George Chip. What does this guy have to do to get respect? He's fighting many of the greatest fighters of all time, like Britain and Co. He's fighting some of the best middleweight champions of the 1910s, like Klaus, Chip, etc. He's beating them. He's beating fighters like Papke and Joe Thomas, who gave Ketchell some nightmare fights. The great Ketchell himself. He's gaining wins over guys who gave Ketchell great fights and Papke beat Ketchell. But apparently Leo Hook is not deserving of any respect because he didn't really do much. Not enough to get in the hall. We're not even finished. Okay. So carrying on in 1912, he, loses, uh, he lost to Jack Dillon in 1913. Like I said, he beat Bob Moha. Common had a grab opponent and that is something that's going to come back. The common Harry Greb opponent, so I'm going to shout out. 1912, he beats George Chip and Billy Papke, like I said. Then in 1912, he gains another win, okay, over a fighter who some may know, some may not. But he was another outstanding middleweight fighter at 1910s. Called Eddie McGorty. Has anybody seen Eddie McGorty's resume? Eddie McGorty was a major middleweight fighter at 1910s. Very tough resume, scored many fantastic wins. Eddie McGorty was not some inexperienced nobody. 
Just like Chip wasn't. Just like Papke wasn't. Just like Joe Thomas wasn't. Just like Frank Klaus wasn't. For a former flyweight, he's beaten a lot of the best middleweights at 1910s, isn't he? And he's beaten a great fighter all round in great puncher Harry Lewis. And he's fought a fight series with my top four greatest welterweight of all time, Jack Britton. I actually rate Jack Britton third at welterweight. He's beaten my number three welterweight of all time. I rate Jack Dillon as a top ten light heavyweight of all time. He's fighting and then, as I will demonstrate, will defeat the Husier Bearcat. So what does Leo Hook have to do to get any respect? Now into 1913, and it goes on year on year on year. He loses to Dylan again, but then he gains a win over Book Krause, who he's lost and drawn to, but he now beats Book Krause and avenges those earlier reverses. People, we're talking about a former flyweight who has moved up weights and is fighting welterweight and middleweight wrecking machines and some at best welterweights and middleweights fighters like Jimmy Gardner Jimmy Gardner who Leo Hookby is a major league fighter he was an excellent fighter you have to credit Leo Hook for beating names like that you have to credit him for beating some at best middleweight contenders at decade in Krause and McGaughty and you've got to credit him for beating some at best middleweight champions at decade in Chip, in Klaus, etc. You have to. But then in 1913, towards the end, he gains another win over George Chip. Then he gains a win over Joe Burrell. Interesting that. Joe Burrell, we're going to come back to him. Now, Leo Hook beat Joe Burrell in 1913. I'm going to highlight another fighter later who lost to Joe Burrell only the following year. But in 1913, he scored another of his great wins. Against the Hussein Bearcat Jack Dillon, who's beat him a few times. Leo Hook, despite the fact he hasn't bested Dillon properly, he gains a win over Jack Dillon. Over a short number of rounds, yes, but he still beats Jack Dillon. This is Jack Dillon only seven to eight months before Jack Dillon becomes the lineal light heavyweight champion of the world. And this is in a period where Dillon is getting many, many major league wins. He is primed. It's the year before Dylan becomes the light heavyweight champion. This is not an inexperienced Dylan. This is not an inexperienced fighter who's, who's green and just coming into it. You know, Jack Dylan has had well over 100 fights by this point. Okay? Then he beats Joe Burrell. We're coming back onto Joe Burrell. Well, don't worry, we are coming back onto Joe Burrell. But that would have, that would have, that would have demonstrated their people, Okay? What I want to do is just do a name crawl, okay, and highlight this fighter who hasn't really done anything to deserve getting in the Hall of Fame. I want to do a roll call of the years I've just covered in wins and losses and listen to this level of opponent in only a three-year period, right? I really want this driving home. So, Harry Lewis. Harry Lewis both wins. Jimmy Gardner, win. Frank Klaus, win. Frank Mantell, win. Battling Levinsky, win. Okay? Frank Klaus, loss. Battling Levinsky, win. Harry Lewis, win. Joe Thomas, win. George Chip, win. Frank Mantell, win. Frank Klaus, loss. Battling Levinsky, win. Book Kraus, loss. Book Kraus, draw. Jack Dillon, loss. Bob Moha, win. Book Kraus, loss. George Chip, win. Billy Papke, win. Eddie McGaughty, win. He also beat the excellent middleweight contender, Australian fighter Dave Smith. Another fantastic fighter from Australia. He also beat Dave Smith as well. I forgot to mention him. He then loses to Jack Dillon. Book Kraus, win. Jack Dillon, win. George Chip, win. Joe Burrell, win. Now in that four year period, and that's now not counting all his other fights against some very capable fighters, some very dangerous contenders. That is what he did, his major opponents in just a four year period. This was after the five fight series with Jack Britton. He's already got that in the bag. One win, one loss, three draws against Jack Britton. My third greatest welterweight of all time. 
when you add all those names, and we're coming back on some of these names, there's another very important point I'm going to highlight. Uh, some people won't like it, okay, because it involves their greatest fighter of all time. But it's a point that I'm going to highlight in regards to Leo Florian Hook. And it's also, when added together with his resume, the fact he's come up all the weights and he's gaining wins over many lineal uh, and world champions, you know, uh, middleweight and light heavyweight, He's fought probably the two best light heavyweights at 1910s, Levinsky and Dillon. He's gained wins over both. He's fought a number of best middleweight champions of the of the 1910s in Chip, in Klaus. He's fought Papke and um, beaten him. Just incredible resume. So this claim that Leo Hook really hasn't done anything, I'm str and this is what I mean. This is why this is part of reason to people in my live chat. Now you understand why I don't engage in debates with these people. Okay, I'm doing this live stream to defend Leo Florian Hook from being downgraded. Because when anyone says, well, Leo Hook, you know, Hall of Fame, it has lots of, what's that person, Grebby, Leo Talk? Yeah, he, he don't really deserve to be, and he ain't really done all, has he? That, that, apparently to this guy, is not degrading or demeaning Leo Hook at all. And when I've just got, and we haven't even done yet, people. We have not even done yet. That's only a snap portion of Leo Hook's career. When I hit my next major point, when I've done his basic career crawl, you will see I will demonstrate. I will demonstrate using, well, someone's number one fighter of all time. <laughs> so, Leo Florian Hook. And you know, when you, go, when you go through his career, it is remarkable. You know, the fight runs he goes on. You know, the, the, the sheer scope of his fights if i if i typed a slide up now of his wins and losses by opponent type in opponent's name and win losses draws the resume is staggering the resume is incredible and this is why leo hook is a worthy hall of fame fighter let me just just give me a second guys Yeah, former flyweight is beaten light heavyweights Moha, Levinsky, Dillon. He's beat Levinsky before he became light heavyweight champion. He's beat Jack Dillon before he became light heavyweight champion. Um, he's beaten George Chip before he became world middleweight champion. But anyway, let us continue on our crawl. Okay. So he loses to Joe Burrell in 1914. Then he beats George Chip in 1914. That is a very, very... Important year again for another fact I will point out later. Then he gains a win over a fighter called Tommy Gavigan. Okay, another name that will come up later. Um, you know, that has certain um, comparisons to someone else. He loses to Younger Hearn in 1915. Beats Frank Mantel. Loses to the outstanding great fighter Mike Gibbons. Okay, Tommy Gibbons' older brother. Who has very few defeats and he's very, very experienced. Okay, nearly 90 fights at the time. He loses to him. Um, so does that mean... Well, no, I won't go there. I, I'm not going to disrespect any fighters. So, and he goes on. He fights people like Faye Kaiser. Do people know Faye Kaiser? Jackie Clark. He loses to Battling Levinsky in 1917. Levinsky has had over 200 fights. Levinsky at this time, okay, who Hook has already beaten a number of times, is now the reigning lineal light heavyweight champion at world. Hook still fights him again, okay. Loses out to Levinsky. He then beats Willie Meehan in 1917. Now, what I want some people to consider when we think about Willie Meehan in 1917, okay? And then only 20-odd days later, he beats Buck Krause. But let's not, let's not talk about that, right? Willie Meehan in 1917. Do me a favor. Anyone out there, when you get a few minutes, go to the career of a great heavyweight champion rated by many called Jack Dempsey, okay? And just look at his resume around 1917, 1919, See how his fights with Willie Meehan go. That's all. That's all I want you to do. Just look at Jack Dempsey's fight series with Willie Meehan. Uh, but Leo Hook beats Willie Meehan. Okay. He then beats Buck Krause again. Okay. In 1917. Into 1918 he beats a fighter called Chuck Wiggins. Okay. Another name that will be prominent in my counterpoint. He also in 1918 loses and win, uh, wins and loses to another Future lineal middleweight champion. 
Yes, very right, Nick. Don't worry, we are kind of covering that. He loses to the very experienced and good fighter Jack McCarron, who many people don't know of. He then beats fighter called Clay Turner. Very, very tough fighter, Clay Turner. Very tough resume. Another former Hadi Greb opponent. Okay, and the win against Clay Turner in 1918 that former flyweight Leo Hook scores. Okay, it's also very important in matchup to the great middleweight that I'm going to highlight Leo Hook against in a more. 1918, after beating Clay Turner, he then beats Gumboat Smith. He beats Gumboat Smith, a heavyweight. Okay. But obviously he doesn't get any credit for that because he hasn't really done much. In 1918, he also fights the fighter and fights to a draw. Okay, over short rounds, but he fights to a draw against a fighter that at one point both Gene Tunney and Harry Greb said was probably the hardest fighter to fight on his day. Jerome Jeffords, a.k.a. Jeff Smith. Leo Hook, even though he's now 14 years into his pro career, he's had a lot of tough fights. He's moved up a lot of weight. He still fights an all-time great in Jeff Smith, okay, fighting him to a draw. He then loses in 1918 to current reigning light heavyweight champion Battle Levinsky. Then in 1919, he loses three times to Harry Greb, and he loses to Mike Gibbons. Okay, Leo Hook is now on the downslide. From 1918 into 1919, Leo Hook clearly goes on the downslide. But even, even then, he's still fighting fake Kaisers. He still fights Gene Tunney a few times. He loses both of them, but he fights Gene Tunney, okay? Past his prime, he still fights Gene Tunney. Um, and, you know, people can't really criticise him for losing to Gene Tunney or some Hall of Famers they mention who also lost to Gene Tunney, you know, would have to get discredited as well. What you have in Leo Hook there is a fighter who came up from small weight did not shy away from major fights, fought many of the best middleweights and light heavyweights and welterweights and some fantastic lightweight fighters and fought a few heavyweights constantly year in, year out and scored many, many wins against them. Okay. Now, what I want to do, okay, is a final... I did a roll call on last slide. We'll go through a roll call this slide. Again, win the opponent and whether he won, lost, draw. George Chip, win. Uh, Frank Mantell, win. Mike Gibbons, a loss. Okay. Um, he then also... Something on me eye. Oh, yeah, I got stung by a wasp the other day. Oh, my God. Do you know, I have not been stung by a wasp for 25 years. I totally forgot what it was like. What a horrible experience. Uh, but anyway, because I don't like wasps. Uh, I don't like them at all. If a wasp comes in my home, it, it has to be killed quickly. Bees, I don't mind. I'll catch them, put them out, or I'll open the door, let them out. But wasps? Nah, 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 nah. The vicious little hate monsters. Yeah, he beats Jackie Clark, very experienced fighter. He loses to Battling Levinsky. He beats a fighter who's already beat him. You know, the, the very good fighter, Jack McCarron. He beats Willie Meehan. In a similar time frame that Willie Meehan is giving Jack Dempsey life or death struggles for Dempsey to win fights. He then also beats Buck Krause win. Chuck Wiggins twice win. Jack McCadden loss. Johnny Wilson win and loss. Clay Turner win. Gumboat Smith win. Jeff Smith draw. Battling Levinsky loss. Hadi Greb three losses. Mike Gibbons loss. Gene Tunney two losses. Blah, blah, blah. When you add that to the run I did last time, you have got an outstandingly tough resume fought against fighters all the way up through the weight divisions whether it's lightweight welterweights like Jimmy Gardner okay whether it's fantastic um, like Bantam Super Bantam to middleweights like Jack Britton who would go on to be my third greatest welterweight of all time whether it's to me probably the two best light heavyweight champions at 1910s in Levinsky and Dylan, He's won and lost to them, but he's also beaten them after moving up in weight. So if this guy doesn't deserve any credit to be in the Hall of Fame, I call into question your Hall of Fame. Because there's, if, if Leo Hook doesn't deserve to get in based on back of that, he gained wins over fighters who gave Ketchel life or death fights. He, Leo Hook beat some of those fighters. Like Papke, like Joe Thomas. He beats them at best middleweight champions at 1910s and four others. 
who were not middleweight champions. He beat many best middleweight contenders, Dave Smith, Kraus, McGarty, on and on. He beat Klaus, he beat cheap middleweight champions, he beat Hall of Famer, uh, he lost, sorry, to Hall of Famer Mike Gibbons. No real disgrace there, losing to Mike Gibbons as a former flyweight coming up through weights. But another point I want to point out on Leo Florian Hook. Now, I want to stress again, I don't want to upset this kid, I know, I know he takes things offensively. And if he came on a live with me, if he responded to my debate challenge, and I contacted my buddy Haplo or someone and found someone to set that debate up, I guarantee that kid won't last 10 minutes. I'll rinse him. Because if he can't stand comments being fired at him, he's never going to survive on a live stream with me. Because I'm going to go in there extremely clinical and hardcore. No nice it is. It's going to be hard and I'm going to bombard that kid. And he'll quit. He'll leave. So Leo Hook okay, beat Jack Battling Levinsky three times. Now, to some people, or him too, Harry Greb is the greatest fighter of all time. So what I want to do is, okay, I want to fire some comparisons at you. Some for you to consider. Leo Hook beat Levinsky three times before Harry Greb fought him. Leo Hook beat George Chip four times before Harry Greb fought him. The thing about the Chip fights is, Leo Hook was beating George Chip when Harry Greb had his fight series with George Chip. It was broken. Wins, losses, draws. Leo Hook beat Josh Chip a whole number of times before Harry Greb fought him. Leo Hook beat Chip in years 1911, 12, 1913, 1914. Greb started fighting George Chip in 1915, 1916. So the year before Greb fought George Chip and, and had some tough fights, Leo Hook had already beat him and beat him a number of times. He has beat a fighter more consistently than the greatest fighter of all time. And he's beat him twice, well, once each, twice, in the in the two years prior to Harry Greb having a more struggling fight series with um, George Chip. So he's beaten future light heavyweight champion Levinsky years before Greb even fought him. Okay, he's beaten George Chip a number of times before Greb then has a harder fight series with him. And then, Leo Hook has beaten Bob Moha, former light heavyweight. He beat him in 1912. It took Adi Greb until night. Adi Greb turned pro in 1913, albeit Leo Hook was a pro earlier. That can factor it a bit. But Greb beat Moha in 1916. Eddie McGaughty. Greb beat him in 1918. Leo Hook already had beat Eddie McGaughty. Book Krause. Leo Hook beat Book Krause in 1913. He also beat Book Krause in 1917. He beat Book Krause in the same year that Harry Greb did. And I'm using Harry Greb on purpose. Because if he's this great fighter, Leo Hook is beating many of these champions or top contenders either before Greb fights them or he's having easier win runs against them. Okay, then what Harry Greb did? He's beat Levinsky before Greb did. He's beaten Chip Easier before Greb did. He's beaten Bob Moha before Greb did. He's beaten Eddie McGarty before Greb did. He's beat Bob Krause before Greb did. And he's beat Bob Krause in the same year that Harry Greb did, 1917. Jack Dillon. Jack Dillon, the Giant Slayer, two of Harry Greb's great name wins on his resume. Okay, against the uh, Hussier Bearcat. Leo Hook had lost, drawn, and he'd lost and beaten Jack Dillon. And when he beat Jack Dillon the first time, it was seven to eight months before Dillon won the light heavyweight title in 1914. He beat Joe Burrell. This is a this is an interesting one. Because Leo Hook, okay, in 1913, beat Joe Burrell. The following year, Hadi Greb lost to Joe Burrell. Tommy Gavigan, Harry Greb beat him in 1915. Leo Hook had already beat him the year before in 1914. Harry Greb beat Fay Kaiser before Leo Hook did. Greb beat him in 1914. Hook beat him in 1916. Jackie Clark, same thing. Greb beat him in 1916. Hook beat him in 1917. And then Willie Meehan, again, 
Okay, just like Buck Krause in 1917, in 1917, both Harry Greb and Leo Hook also beat Willie Meehan. The Willie Meehan who gave Dempsey a very difficult fight series. Now, Greb has beat Willie Meehan and they'd say, oh yeah, Greb, you know, great win. But Leo Hook beat him the same year as Greb beat him. When we look, okay, at Chuck Wiggins, Greb beat Chuck Wiggins first time in 1919. Guess who had beaten Chuck Wiggins twice the year before? Leo Florian Hook. Johnny Wilson, Greb had to wait until now. I mean, Greb had to wait to fight Wilson, okay. But Leo Hook had already won and lost to him in 1918. When we look at Clay Turner, Greb beat Clay Turner the first time in 1918. Guess who also beat Clay Turner in 1918? Clay Turner was a very tough, experienced fighter. Very, very tough fighter. Greg beat him in 1918. Leo Hook beat him in 1918. And when we look at Gumboat Smith, how did Greg beat Gumboat Smith in 1920? The former flyweight Leo Florian Hook beat Gumboat Smith in 1918. Battling Copin, Greb beat him faster, 1917 to Hook's 1919. Larry Williams, Leo Hook beat um, Larry Williams in 1919, the year before Harry Greb did. Now, in doing this, I'm not diminishing Harry Greb. He's my second greatest fighter of all time. But what I'm trying to do is, as well as going through the career crawl, where I demonstrate that Hook did not fight a Green Levinsky and he did not fight a Green Britain. If Jab Britain is still green after 60 professional fights and Leo Hook is green after over 200 professional rounds experience, I don't know what to say to some people. That is rejected. Both of them rejected. Okay, out of hand. When it comes on to the he didn't do much, he beat names like Papke and Joe Thomas who gave Ketchell life or death struggles. One of those Joe Thomas fights went massive rounds. And those fights were hard. And in some of those fights, Ketchel were badly hurt. In one of them, really nearly out on his feet. He had to go into survival mode for three or four rounds before coming back to beat Joe Thomas, stopping him. Those were not easy fights. Leo Hook beat Joe Thomas. Ketchel had a four-fight series with Papke losing one of them. Leo Hook beat Billy Papke. And when we think about the other names that, Le that Leo Florian Hook fought or beat, he beat many of the best light heavyweight fighters at 1910s, from Moha to uh, Levinsky to Dylan, and like I've already pointed out, he also beat many of the best middleweights of that decade. He didn't beat Harry Greb in 1919, but Hook were past his prime by then. That's not an excuse, but he still has to get credit for fighting your greatest fighter of all time, past his prime, and he still went in that ring and tried his best. Maybe, to some people, he doesn't get any credit for fighting... A first or second greatest fighter of all time. Three times past his prime. But to other people, he does. Now, another point I want to another point I want to make. Out, okay, is I want to look at um, the middleweights. Okay, the lineal middleweight champions. Okay, now Papke had won middleweight title in 1908. Of Ketcho Ketchel, of course, became the first man in history to regain the world middleweight title. Um, in 1908, and then Ketchel was shot and killed in October 1910. Okay. But there were a number of claimants after that, okay? Papke uh, was one of them. Claimants at middleweight title. Leo Hook beat him, okay? Frank Klaus, another claimant at title. Before he got the lineal title, Leo Hook beat him. Eddie McGorty, another claimant for middleweight title. Leo Hook beat him. Now, Frank Klaus became lineal middleweight champion in 1913. Leo Hook had already beat him before that. George Chip became lineal middleweight champion in 1913. Leo Hook beat him twice before that, in once each in 1911 and 1912, and then guess what? Leo Hook beat George Chip the year he became lineal middleweight champion, and the and only 18 months, 20 months before George Chip gave Harry Greb a very tough fight series. Johnny Wilson, who got the lineal title 1920. Leo Hook won and lost to him. No, let's carry on. Let's carry on. We have to, we have to keep going through this, okay? The first lineal light heavyweight champion of the 1920s. There were three lineal light heavyweight champions at 1920s now with Jack O'Brien 
um, relinquishing the lineal, the light of weight title in 1905, it left a gap and there were much fighting over it. The lineal middleweight champion, okay, the first one at decade at 1910s was Jack Dillon. Yeah, Hook had already won and lost before Jack Dillon became lineal light of weight champion. Same with battling Levinsky. He lost to Levinsky later when Levinsky were lineal light of weight champion from 16 to 20. But Leo Hook had already beat Levinsky a number of times before that. And when you add into that, all those common opponents, many of whom Leo Hook beat in the same year that Harry Greb did. Okay, let's do a recap. Buck Kraus, Leo Hook beat him the same year. This is a former flyweight people coming up. Harry Greb turned pro around 140, 141 pounds. Leo Hook's former flyweight. So he beat Buck Kraus same year Harry Greb did. Okay. Um, what are the fights? Willie Meehan, he beat him same year Harry Greb did. And it just goes on. You know, um, Clay Turner, he beat him same year Harry Greb did. And he also beat all those fighters. He beat Joe Burrell the year before Harry Greb lost to him. He beat George Chip only a few years before Harry Greb had that two fight series. What I'm trying to get at with this, okay, is when you were talking about great fighters, what, what, think about, Leo Hook doesn't deserve to be in the hall, okay, now, not, not answering to this young kid, okay, because like I said, I don't want to offend him, he obviously, you know, I might up, upset his weekend, but, what do, think about is, we are boxing fans in this chat. Big shout out to Scrapbook Boxing. Big shout out to the Boxing Librarian Quiz Champion Trey X. Nick Armour as well, runner up. And everyone who took part. You know, Bruce Gass, Andre Rodriguez, Haplo. Um, everyone who took part. Lisa Bales, all of them. Big shout out to you all. Okay, uh, I really enjoyed doing the quiz. It passed some time on while I'm getting my new super series of career videos ready. Um, where, like I said, we'll cover fighters like McGorty, uh, Buck Krause, Harry Lewis. All of these fighters will be getting videos. Um, you know, I'm starting off at heavyweight. Um, but I'm going to go through and thank you to Scrapbook for um, unknowingly motivating me to redoing what I referred to as my blue screens and my pre-rating era videos. Redoing them, all uniformed, same stats, same breakdown, but starting from the 1890s, coming through. Um, so thank you to him for giving me that spark and that motivation. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. So. So what do we want great fighters to do? We want great fighters to push boundaries. Yeah, I think everyone will agree. We want our great fighters to push the boundaries of what we think they can achieve. Because ultimately, when you look at... I'm not talking to this irrelevant kid, okay? But when we look at boxing, guys, okay? We want our fighters to push the boundaries so we can see how far they go and how well they can do. And in Leo Florian Hook, coming from fly and fighting heavyweights, and fighting great fighters, like I said... Harry Lewis was an extremely dangerous fighter. He was a vicious body puncher. He was a very good puncher all round. What he didn't know about boxing, you could you just want worth knowing in first place. A super experienced ring general. Harry Lewis was a major, major league fighter. Okay? When you are beating people like him and beating people like Levinsky and beating people like Dylan and beating people like Jack Britton and beating all of these fighters, all these other fighters like Klaus and Chip and all the top middleweight contenders like Dave Smith, the Australian and McGarty and Buck Kraus and that, you know, beating capable welterweight middleweights like Frank Mantello were very good fighters. Just wait till I do Frank Moody's career video, people. You're in for a shocker on that one. But the, the thing is, this is what we want fighters to do. This is how fighters make themselves great. By pushing boundaries. And Leo Hook pushed the ultimate boundary in going from fly to heavyweight, fighting great fighters across multiple weight divisions. Even though he lost to Greb, to Tunney, okay, to Mike Gibbons, and lost to Levinsky and Dylan and others, he also beat many of the others. Even though he lost to Britain, he beat Britain. Even though he lost to Levinsky, he beat Levinsky. He fought multiple fights against Hall of Fame or all-time greats from lightweight to light heavyweight. All those weights. He fought fighters, many of whom would rate in my top tens across those divisions. 
or very close to top tens in those divisions. And that's what we want in it. We want fighters to push the boundaries. That is how Leo Hook made himself great. He pushed a boundary that even Pacquiao couldn't match. Pacquiao got to light middleweight. Pacquiao didn't fight at light heavyweight, did he? Did Pacquiao fight at heavyweight? Leo Hook set a precedent there. Other fighters also set and matched. Fighters like Carpentier, Kid Lewis and others. Okay? He's one of the great weight movers in boxing history. He was a very robust, hearty, driven fighter. He wouldn't... If he was fighting top-level fighters, he wouldn't run around the ring and try and survive and try and outpoint them. He'd fight them in the pocket. People... He's fighting people like Jack Dillon in the pocket. He's not afraid of Jack Dillon. We want our fighters to show heart. And Leo Hook fighting all these great fighters across all these weight divisions, that shows his heart, his drive, his competitiveness. We want our fighters to push boundaries. We want them to be competitive. We want our fighters to build great resumes. And Leo Hook has a great resume. And anybody who denies Leo Hook's resume, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I just cannot take you seriously at all. Yeah, thank you for that scrap. Uh, thank you, brother. Yeah, um, I look forward to that. Um, yeah, Scott Brocard, I know you kind of missed me live earlier uh, other day, but um, due to certain things on YouTube, I'm doing my new career playlist private. But uh, basically, what I'm do what I'm what I'm doing, scrap is um, I'm gathering people's emails. I've got yours, of course, anyway, so you're automatically included. Um, random too, but these. Basically, what it does is I, I, I share all my career videos privately. So only the people who I attach the email address to can click on it and watch it and sign in and watch it. Okay. Um, I don't like having to take this step, but I, I just want to make a lot of my new content, my new career videos, um, just for more for my subscribers and my friends on here, more, more than anything, um, and not for wider YouTube. That, that's what I'm doing. Um... But yeah, everyone I've got emails for will receive copies of my new videos and it, it'll say private, please sign in. You just click sign in and boom, you can watch it. But then that video can't be shared to someone if their email's not attached to that video. So say like if I got one of those videos and shared it with my mate, he'd click on it, but it wouldn't let him play it. That's what I'm doing. It's sad I have to do that, but you know, I just don't want people, you know, who are disrespectful or ungrateful or any of those things to access my content and later troll me no so yeah so leo hook i mean what do we think people what do you think i've just gone through a, a brief i could go super deep but i'm not going to i'd be on here three or four hours you know and it, it, scrapbook will agree you know leo hook's resume is so deep and he pushed the boundaries fighting big fighters fighting great fighters across multiple weights he pushed the boundaries okay he really really did and that's what makes him a great fighter. Pushing the boundaries. Fighting Hall of Famers or great fighters across multiple weight classes and gaining many wins. And it's not only the Hall of Famers, like I said. It's the Joe Thomas, it's the Dave Smith, it's the Krauses, it's the McGaughty's, it's the Mohars, it's all the other fighters he fought. The Clay Turners, the Chuck Wiggins, the Willie Means. When you look at Leo Hook's resume and someone says, well, he doesn't deserve to be in all because he hasn't really done all. I mean, that is... I don't know the motivation for that comment. I don't know if it's just ignorance of Leo Hook. Or if there's something else at work. But when someone says a comment like that. I really can in no way shape or form. Understand that logic. I've demonstrated how we beat many opponents in the same year that Hadi Greb were beating them. Or beat some of Hadi Greb's tough opponents. Before Hadi Greb fought them. Ah, Nick Armour, Scrapbook Boxing, you still going private with your work? Oh, so Scrapbook had the same idea as well. Well, actually, Scrapbook, how you do it, it's, it's actually very clever. Um, when you upload a video, brother, to YouTube, you upload it private so people can't click on it. Then you go into the video, edit video in YouTube Studio, edit video, you click on video and edit. 
Um, and where it says public, unlisted, pri uh, private, when you click on private, it brings a box up underneath saying share privately. When you click on that, you can add people's email addresses in and it will it will send notifications to those people. So currently what I'm doing, as well as finishing me all of fame, me all of all time greats ready for new career videos, um, I'm also working, building an email list. It's all going to be done by 20th of July. So seven days, people. Uh, one, two or three days after that, the first video, Langford will come. Then we're doing, in no particular order, but you know, um, Jackson, Klondike, Johnson, Jeanette, McVeigh, Hart, Burns, on and on, okay? Going through the heavyweights, 18, 19, 19, 10. And I may carry on and just think, oh, I'm enjoying it. So let's carry on with heavyweights, 19, 10, 19, 30. And people, will, when they look at my playlist, they'll notice that I've called the playlists all heavyweight, 18, 90 to 19, 10. Now, the reasoning behind that, if you, if you click on my channel and click on playlist, you'll see 17 brand new empty playlists. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is when the heavyweights get to 19, 10, when I do the first heavyweight, who I'm considering more from the era of 1910, 1930, I will change the title of the playlist to 1890 to 1930. So when people look at my playlist, they can monitor my progress until eventually I get to 1890 to present. And, and when I do that, that means that playlist is finished, if you get me. So people can track where I am. Because if, if I'm doing heavyweights and I'm really enjoying it, I may decide to carry on and do a bit more before going to light heavyweight. But my original plan was, I do 1890 to 1910 heavyweight, 1890 1910 light heavyweight. Of course, there's no intermediate divisions. The first intermediate divisions that will come in, and there'll be no flyweight, because I'm going more from advent at lineal established world title, 1916 for flyweight. So basically, uh, Jim Wildwood first champion. So basically what uh, I was going to do is go down 1890 to Bantam, then back up 1910 1930, Okay, and then go down, heavyweight, light, heavyweight. Now, into that period, that's when the first intermediate divisions will appear. Fighters like Jack Kid Wolf, super bantamweight champion, super feather, light welter. These divisions cropped in. The later went on hiatus, okay? But some of these divisions cropped up. So the first fighters from those di divisions, like Jack Kid Wolf, you know, like some of these other fighters, they will get their videos. Again, Jack Kid Wolf people, I'm doing so many fighters I ain't done before. You're in for a treat. Uh, I'm doing so many fighters I didn't do career videos for before. So that me and the reason I'm doing that is it's for my long-term subscribers who watch so many of them blue screen videos and career breakdowns. I want to include way more fighters, okay? So for people on that email list, you're going to get loads of treats by having loads of videos on fighters I haven't covered before. Um, and then I'm just going to chug away. You know, and like I said, thank you to Scrapbook for giving me a spark of inspiration on that one. Um, but I'm doing way more fighters. And my retired database will grow as a result. Because I've got over 1,200 fighters in there. But it's going to grow. Because there's still fighters I haven't got in there. Going through divisions like this, I will get more fighters in there. So yeah, Leo Hook, not worthy of the haul. When you look at his career, how he pushed boundaries, the quality of wins he had. You know, uh, I just downright reject that claim. Um, and I think Scrap would agree with me. I think, you know, anybody who knows Leo Florian Hook's resume and his career and what kind of fighter he was would completely disagree with an assessment that Leo Hook has not really done out. Big shout out to Andre Rodriguez in the chat. Yeah, Nick, I'm still waiting for your list of five stat books, mate, for second place. Uh, email me when you're ready. Let me know in a comment or in an email, mate, and uh, I will provide. I was actually getting stat book ready today on Willie Davis. Um, but I thought I'd jump on segue and jump on and get this live stream out of the way. Because then up until 20th, I've got seven days to finish my Hall of Fame and my all-time great list. Um, and it will be finished. If it's not finished at that point, it's frozen for new videos. Um, because my Hall of Fame and not all of all time greats won't suddenly be made and be stopped. It's going to be a thing that will do, grow and develop over years. I'm not waiting five years before doing um, the um, videos. I'm starting them now. Um, and I want to make the playlist much bigger and better. Way more fighters covered. 
through boxing history and the reason i'm doing it that way 18 19 19 10 19 10 19 30 is so that when you when you click on the playlist the video at the top will be 18 90 to 19 10 then as you scroll down you'll start going to the next decade the next decade the next decade all the way through to modern time you know um last decade 2010s with vitaly and vladimir klitschko and other fighters i'll highlight there as well um and then into 2020s you see as these fighters retire you know, like Fury, Joshua, Wilder, they'll get their videos put on that playlist as well. It will be something that I will build and then I can add other fighters in old time if I want. I'll just drag and drop and move them up into their kind of area. But then, as new fighters retire, it's not all mixed up where you get one fighter from 1970, then three fighters from 1920s, then two fighters from 1990s, then one fighter from 60s, and one fighter from 2010s, like me of the blue screens. Um... You know, I want to really get a nice structure to it. So what do we think, people? Do you agree that Leo Hook is not worthy of the Hall of Fame and has not really done it? Right, let's see. Let's have a look. Let's go through some comments, people, before I get off. It's been lovely coming on with you today and having a nice chat. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, shout it out, everybody down here. Rasclot, good to see you, Rasclot, buddy. Hope you're well. Nick Armour. Nick Armour, Willie Meehan, another great fly to every fighter. Willie Meehan was more bantamweight to heavyweight, but very close to fly, Nick, you're right. And Willie Meehan doesn't get no credit. When I do Willie Meehan's career video, Nick, you're in for a nice surprise on that one. Um, scrapbook, um, what a great fighter BL, came around at a time when there were real solid middleweight and light heavyweights, great presentation brother, great to see everyone, thank you Scrap, appreciate that, big shout out to Bruce Gass in the chat, also, um, someone mentioned to me that they had a, a funny experience on my channel, okay, uh, I don't want that to happen again. So Treyx is now. Uh, I'm going to put him as a moderator. So if he has any further bad experience, he can deal with it. Um, the only thing, Trey, I don't like people hiding en masse. But any name calling, trolling, racism, feel free to get rid of people. Uh, and also, it protects yourself on my channel as a as a admin. Um, let's have a look yes Andre congratulations Trey it's a Nick for amazing performance in quiz I have to tell you those two guys big shout out to those two guys because I'll tell you something from question 85 to 86 to 87 to 88 to 89 it were drawing then one's ahead then one catches up then one goes two ahead then one gets one back there's one point then one catches up then he goes one ahead then it was an absolute seesaw battle and literally there was one point in it with two questions to answer Oh my goodness, what a battle. Those those guys both did great. But big shout out to everyone, like I said, Lisa Bales and Andrea, everyone who took part. It was fun. Uh, Nick Armour, ah, thanks BL. I've only read me and fought from Flyway. I've not seen evidence of it, so thanks for that. Bruce Gass, what do you think of doing a video on Polino Uskadun? Ah, Bruce, I am definitely doing a career video on Polino Uskadun, the Spanish heavyweight, for sure. Um, he'll be getting one in decade 1910-1930, um, after I've covered earlier heavyweights. But yeah, Polino Uskadun, along with Dempsey and uh, me and, and all those guys around heavyweight, Gumbo, everybody, they'll, they'll be getting their career videos. Uh, yeah, finally a career video on uh, video on Gumboat Smith. <laughs> but yeah, Willie Meehan as well, and Polino Uskadun, and Wills, and Dempsey, and all those fighters, George Godfrey, um, Sharky, on and on. I I'm going to be doing so many videos. I want each playlist on weight divisions to be fully fleshed out. I'm not going to go too crazy and do every heavyweight fighter in history, because even I ain't got time to do that for 17 weight divisions, but I'm going to do a lot. So people, I will get off. I have got, I don't think I'm going to do another live stream in the next seven days. Um, everything now is focused on my start books, getting my Hall of Fame and all-time great list ready for my new videos. I've already started um, with um, updating Sam Langford's career video with my Hall of Fame members and the all-time great 
Hall of Fame members. Um, I've redesigned the stat slides at the end. I've took some out I'm not too bothered about. Um, I've restructured the stat slides at the end. But now every fighter, okay, because I started this late last time, I started adding a slide on it and saying, where they're rated in top 50 greatest title records of all time, where they're rated in top 50 greatest pound pound records, their overall all time position, their position by country. Every video now has that slide on. Okay, so every video has that slide on now at the end. And that's one thing I wanted to do to also update, um, you know, my blue screens because I did a miggledy piggledy, fighters across different eras all mixed up. Um, and I, I wanted to reorganize, restructure them and do a better job. All of them are uniformed, all of them have the same stats on information on. Um, they're all done the same. So it's better to compare and contrast for you guys who watch one and then think, right, I'll watch. You know, who did Gumbo do better than Willie Meehan? He's, Willie Meehan has a great resume, a tough resume himself, as you'll see. But I'll save all the surprises. So everybody who I've got emails for, anybody else, you have got seven days to get me the emails. Um, because in eight or nine days, the Langford videos come in, and then the videos will be coming fairly consistently. So if you don't get me the emails before that, um, then basically you won't be able to watch them. <laughs> you know, So get me an email. Um, and like I've said, okay, you can go to boxinglibrarian.com and leave a message there. Um, or uh, if, actually, if Bruce Gass is still in the chat, um, if someone has my email that I've gave them, the boxing librarian email, would would someone be, be please be able to share that with Bruce Gas for me, if they have his email? I, I'm authorizing it. It's because I'm having some people are having major trouble getting emails to me. They can't leave me in YouTube comments because YouTube has that GDPR thing that nails emails and doesn't allow them to be posted for privacy. So Bruce mentioned, you know, he'd want the new video sharing. So uh, I authorize anyone in my live chat who has contact with Bruce Gas that could one of you please send in my boxing librarian Gmail um, so Bruce can message me so that then, you know, I can add him to the email list for the new videos and new content. Uh, if someone could do that. Oh, <laughs> oh, is that it? So is the... Oh, the it's at the front. Oh, nice and easy, Bruce. There you are, mate. Let me just... Uh, I'll just make a note of that. Nice and easy, Bruce. Yep, I have got it, Bruce. What I'll do is I'll send you an email later so you have mine. And then you're all good. You're added to the um, list. So, yeah, big shout out to everybody. Big shout out to everybody. I will be back soon starting my new blue screen replacement. I built those blue screens over a number of years. I was proud of them, but I can do better. They're all going to be uniform now. Way more fighters are going to get it done in more weight, in the weight divisions than I did before. Um, I'm going to miss. I'm going to get in some glaring exceptions, like I mentioned, the outstanding fighter Harry Lewis, um, and many other fighters, Willie Meehan, and, and and many contenders who didn't get done before. Um, you know, like Book Krauses, McGorty's, George Chips, many others. They're all going to get career videos starting on the heavyweights. If I'm doing heavyweights and I get to 1910, I think I've covered who I want to cover. I'm excited. I may carry on and do heavyweights to 1930, and then go down to light heavyweight, where of course we'll cover people like um, Root. Chorinsky, Gardner, all these early light heavyweight guys. Um, and then go down to middleweight, okay, and, and cover um, Butler and Craig and Ryan and all the early middleweights, young Peter Jackson, etc., etc. Um, going down to Bantamweight, then to 1910, 1930, that's when Flyweight will get the first entries at the bottom. Um, you know, fighters like um, Gennaro, uh, Jimmy Wilde, Pancho Villa, Fidel LaBarba, um, Willie Davis. He's in my retired database, but I don't know if I did Willie Davis's career. Um, so, yeah. So I'll get off, guys. All you take care. Have a blessed day wherever you are. Thank you to Bruce for that um, Gmail right there. Um, and, um, yeah. 
look forward to my new content and it's great to see scrapbook back i haven't seen him for a little while um you know he's he's been busy with life but it's good to see him back um and long will my content continue going forward more start books and piles of new career videos to come everyone take care have a blessed day i'm out for now